Okay. People are joining one by one. Welcome to Fergus, Ashley, and Peter. Welcome to this session. Okay, because the program says I should start the introduction at 4.45 p.m. Sydney time, I just start saying hello to everyone. Uh, we are still waiting for Julia, who is the moderator. So to be honest, I don't need to introduce anyone because this panel has a moderator and the moderator is going to introduce everyone, giving the bar notes and what we are going to what they are going to talk about. So I'm here just as um, one of the members of the organizing committee to say welcome. Thank you for being with us on the second day of the conference. And uh, it's great to see you all online and we'll see you tomorrow in Sydney. Uh, so I think I'll be around, very brief introduction. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good to see you all here in this panel. The organizing committee, especially Ben, really wanted to have a variety of different modes of presentations. So uh, it was really good when we heard that Julia was organizing a roundtable discussion around this topic. So I don't really have anything to say in terms of introduction because this panel has a moderator, and the moderator, Julia, is going to introduce all the members of the panel. So uh, we have a discussion. First, the participants discuss the topic, and then towards the end, the second half, we have a Q&A by the audience. So it would be great if you can make sure that you are muted, and if you have any questions, it would be great if you put it in the chat box or raise your hand, and then Julio would ask you to speak up. So on the lolitics of human and social inequality, moderated by Julia Dubray from Wellington, Victoria University of Wellington. And with her, we have Angelina Hurley, my colleague at Griffith. And it's interesting for you to know that Angelina and myself and Cliff Goddard and Zarek Hannessy, we organized the 2020 AHSN conference at Griffith University. That was the last in-person conference for many people before COVID, uh, up until like two years after. We have Deborah Eddy, my former colleague at Griffith University and Jackie Brady from University of Melbourne. Okay, it's time for me to go away and hand it over to Julia. Julia, please. Thank you, Reza. Um, a warm welcome to everybody to this intersectional roundtable on humour and social inequality. We've put together this roundtable because we wanted to invite discussion on how members of minoritized groups use humour to resist social inequalities. And to do that today, we have four panellists here who have a mix of research experience, comedy experience, and lived experience as members of multiple minoritized groups. Together, we work in indigenous, queer, feminist, disability, and neurodivergent humor. So we're covering quite a spectrum of minoritized experiences between us. And each of us will share our perspective on how humor in these different areas can be used not just to highlight social inequalities, but also to advance social change. So um, we have an hour together here today, um, and we're going to start with a short intro by myself, where I'll make a few observations on humour and minoritised groups for five minutes or so. Um, and then we'll move on to the panellists who are each going to introduce themselves and their work for five or so minutes, followed by a discussion between us as the four panellists, which, which I'll lead, but we will contribute to. Um, and then for the second half of the roundtable, we really want to open up 
to the audience um, for you to share your comments, questions, and your own experiences in this area as well. Um, so to start with, just some observations on, on humour and minoritised groups. So as I'm sure all of you will be aware, humour is not just about making people laugh, but serves a range of social functions. On the positive side, it can be used to create solidarity, to emphasise or attenuate power relationships, to provide tension relief and to construct various forms of social identity. On the other hand, however, it can also be used to enact prejudice, to exclude, to harass, to ridicule, and so on. Members of minoritized groups have often been subjected to these more negative functions of humor, but we also use humor for all of the different positive functions that it serves. Two particularly important concepts in relation to humor used by minoritized groups are uh, solidarity building and boundary marking humor. Members of minoritized groups use solidarity building humor to draw ourselves closer together. For example, to reinforce cultural identity or to release tension related to our experience. We use boundary marking humor to distance ourselves from majority group members who might pose some kind of threat to us. For example, by highlighting cultural differences and drawing attention to problematic majority behaviors. And often we use both of these forms of humour at once. In all of these ways, humour can be a powerful strategic resource for members of minoritised groups, not just to highlight inequality, but also to affect social change, as I mentioned before. And the last point to note here is that um, members of minoritized groups are often multiply minoritized so an example of that would be that there's a high proportion of rainbow young people in New Zealand who are disabled 40 percent of them are disabled as well as rainbow um, and in the Australian context Aboriginal women for instance face both racism and sexism and what's important, as those of you who know about the intersectional approaches will be aware, is that in these, these situations, it's not, it's a case of the sum being more than its parts. So the effects of both in those instances, both types of minoritization can be amplified um, to create further layers of minoritization. So it's really important that any analysis of minority humor takes an intersectional approach, looking at the interconnectedness of people's different identities within overlapping systems of privilege and oppression. Here to discuss these points and whatever else comes to mind are our panelists. So I'm happy to introduce to you today, Angelina Hurley, who is a writer and PhD candidate at Griffith University, um, Deborah Eddy, an artist and researcher with a PhD in visual arts, um, Jackie Brady, a PhD candidate and comedian, um, candidate at the University of Melbourne, and myself, Julia DeBress. I'm a senior lecturer in linguistics at Massey University in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So when we were um, talking about the panel and the roundtable and how we wanted to run it, um, I asked the panellists to each speak to you for around five minutes or so, addressing the following questions. What are your intersecting identities? What's the context of humour that you work in? How have you seen humour used in that context to advance social change? And what are the risks and rewards or challenges and opportunities of doing so? So um, I'd like to get us rolling by passing over, first of all, to Angelina to talk to us. Oh, that's very large. I wasn't expecting that. Looks like it hasn't quite come out how we want it, Angelina. I'm sorry about that. You might have that's to right. talk to it. Yeah. The missing words. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I'd firstly like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that the conference is taking part on today and um, that the panel is speaking from. Um, I am a Queensland um, Aboriginal woman. Um, I live born in bred in Brisbane. Um, my nations uh, come from uh, the four parts of my grandparents' side was Garang, Garang, Manindali, Dera and Gamilaroi. 
um, my, my work experience is that I've worked in the arts for many years and in education and, and community cultural development work. And I'm presently doing a PhD at Griffith University on Aboriginal humour. Um, and it's a creative project. Um, well, I'm writing um, a set of scripts for a TV series and an exegesis attached to explaining that. Um, my purpose for doing that is um, was to explore Indigenous, there's not very many um, academic studies on um, Aboriginal humour and I um, and the purpose of doing a creative project and attaching the exegesis is to, to it is for a multitude of purposes, like I'm answering some of those questions there that are on my slide. Um, from my work experience and life experience, I don't really talk uh, too much from an academic perspective. It's all from um, lived experience and life experience and practical experience. Um, a lot of it is storytelling um, and, and, and um, to express how indigenous, how Aboriginal uh, humour is expressed and utilised um, um, from our perspective and also how it's um, accepted by audiences. Um, the purpose of the series is to educate, to share humour and stories to debunk myths and stereotypes and racism and understanding is all, sort of like an, edu for an educational tool. Um, and um, we explore areas in my exegesis about, you know, how we identify it, um, the, um, the uniqueness of it, what makes it unique, which I believe it is, um, um, how we use it um, as a tool of resistance and survival and healing and catharticism and all of all of that sort of stuff. Um, what other questions was there, Julia? Wow, that's a good start. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but if you want, I don't know if you want to say any more about um what you're talking about there about the unique features of Aboriginal humour. Maybe you can just share a little bit more about that because I think that sometimes people, um, you know, when we're thinking about minoritised groups, I remember you and I were talking the other day about how um, not all humour in Aboriginal communities is about trauma, right? That you were yeah. saying that it's a, there's a long history of, of humour as a core cultural feature of Aboriginal society. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, um, well... Um, I always like to acknowledge Annie Lilly and Holt, who's, who's the first person I believe to have started academic research in this field. And um, you can hear her on some ABC um, podcast radio shows and stuff. And she started this research and quite humorously stated that uh, doing a PhD in this area took all the um, took all the funny and the laugh out of it. But um, she, some of her research and some of the conversations she was having through community. And that was that um, there was a big surprise about the existence of humour, um, ab Aboriginal humour and the awareness from a non-Indigenous audience that it exists. And um, um, that was surprising to me. Um, but then I have, have met people. She's had some, she had some um, very strange conversations with people that thought that it was incongruous. And um, so, so she was doing a community uh, um, case studies on that sort of stuff. So I've sort of feel like I've picked up the mantle there and um, really wanted to keep exploring the uniqueness of um, Aboriginal humour, what makes it so unique, what, um, what it identifies, what the specific specificities of it. Um, and, and that's things like, you know, uh, pre and post uh, colonisation, mm -hmm. how it's come about, um, different, um, you know, it's different all around the country as well, you know, as well as our language and and nations and stuff like that. Um, it differs um, the impact of colonizations and and how it um, has affected um, our humor, um, location and locality and language. All of that sort of stuff is all, all combined to make it very specific and unique. <coughs> Awesome. Thank you very much. I think that's a great intro. Um, we just had a comment in the chat that it's a bit hard to hear you, Angelina, um, with your microphone. Um, so maybe, yeah, um, we'll move on to the next person next now, but maybe, yeah, just for the discussion later, it'd be good if you could yeah, be a bit close to the mic. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll just pass on for our next intro to um, Deborah Eddy. Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. I identify as a cis 
white older woman, as you can see. Um, I have a doctorate in visual arts and I'm an independent researcher and artist. As a visual artist, I make costumes uh, in which I perform, and that's generally uh, video art, performance art, and the context of my work has been the invisibility of ageing women. And my artwork attempts to make older women visible, and I do this through the choices of material. Uh, I use a lot of high vis and workwear and safety wear. And the other part of my work that I speak a lot about is the ongoing and crushing domesticity that women um, endure and even into old age, it doesn't stop. I can tell you that now, I'm still hard at work in the house. Um, many artists use their work to try and advance social change. It's our way of making issues visible. And I know feminist artists past and present, a lot of them have used humour in their work. And performance art particularly lends itself to humour um, because you can actually act out um, a role, if you like. And if I'm in costume, I, I go to a different place and I'm, it enables me to be silly, if you like, not silly as in stupid or dithering or anything like that, but I, I can make myself into somebody else. And humour is really important when talking about ageism because um, older people cop a lot of um, jibes at being old and dithering and forgetful and all of that sort of uh, thing. And with there's a lot of backlash against us now as because we're boomers and so there's a lot of memes and such talking about us as being old and swallowing up all the resources in the world. Um, in terms of my work, I think it's it's there's always a risk that audiences may not get what I'm I'm talking about, but I try very hard to make work that people can find humorous and it can start a conversation and and then we can actually talk about the sorts of issues that I want to raise. With the images that you can see on your screen, the first one is C is for climate change. And I don't know how many of you in the audience would be aware of the Knitting Nanas who are activists for climate change. And they use humor in various forms in their work and um, Myself and Beatrice will be talking at length about them in our talk on Friday, but I wanted to make a work that didn't parry them, but which paid homage to their work in climate change. The middle image is my doctoral examination work and myself and 20 women actually chanted a poem about giving older women visibility. And the last work, H is for housework, is about my domesticity uh, angle of work. And in this video, I very um, uninterestingly try and dust, um, wipe the floor, I get dragged along the floor in that costume, which is made from microfiber cloths. And then the last scene is where I wipe dishes all over my body. And I guess that's that's probably what I wanted to say. Um, and I'll leave it up to people to then ask me questions later on. Thank you. Thanks very much, Deborah. Uh, our next panelist is Jackie Brady. Jackie, you're muted. I thought I had unmuted. <laughs> I thought it was a frequent pause, but there we go. <laughs> could, have, could, have been, could have been like my photo there, which was the director said, smile for the camera, so I did. So, 
Uh, my name is Jackie Brady. I'm coming to you from NAM, otherwise known as Melbourne, from the lands of the Wurundjeri Boonwurrung people. And I'd like to acknowledge Elders past, present, future and emerging. And uh, I came to comedy through my practice as an applied anthropologist. I identified as dis disabled. I am an autistic person. I'm non-binary. I am also have a physical disability and uh, a couple of chronic illnesses on the top of that. Uh, I do walk with a stick. It is a lightsaber because at least if I'm going to have a stick, it's at least going to have the impression that I can cut your legs off um, because it's, and that's a joke I often use on stage, obviously. Uh, I came to do comedy through working in community arts as part of other roles in community development in remote places largely and there were things about video clips, about uh, music projects that I was involved with. There were projects about uh, postcards. We made funny postcards to help people avoid scammers. A, a number of things, working in a women's shelter with art therapy, things like that. And I ended up doing comedy to, I, I'm not really sure why. I think a colleague said, you're funny, you should try. And then my comedy all became about playing with stereotypes while flipping them and debunking them. And then I got further and further involved and I started a PhD project in 2020 because my Melbourne International Comedy Festival show run got cancelled from COVID and I was looking at what to do next and I thought this is a perfect opportunity to bring together my interest in social change in things that work and and something that I've become involved with as a as a person so my phd project is participatory action research it is in political science um and today i think after i get off here i'm going to complete the last of the field work with one last interview uh, but so far I have done 24 expert interviews with people from grassroots comedy to uh, national national names, big names we call them, people that are retired uh, through to, you know, they're all people that, that, that have an active interest in the kind of comedy that educates as well. And I've just put some quotes on I'm here from my, my perspective uh, one of my interests is is the gatekeeping that goes on in in comedy. There's a phenomenon where we say to in order to get a name in comedy or to get gigs or to continue, you need to get stage time. But if you are doing comedy that is not mainstream, it gets harder. It gets called niche niche comedy, and it's it gets harder. And there's a lot of gatekeeping that goes on because you're just seen as the insert commas autistic you know performer or all those sort of things uh, which is interesting but a couple of things uh, you know that when I work with people on, on stereotypes about autistic people I have walked on stage carrying a dinosaur under my arm and said that um, I'm not a per this is autism so am I a person with autism or am I autistic because there are several members of the community, some people in the community prefer person with autism, some people prefer to be identity first um, autistic people. But you get things like I didn't think autistic people understood jokes, uh, so I flipped a few of those stereotypes around. Again, there is a particularly unique uh, humour style with autistic people. Uh, part of it comes from the fact we can be very literal and and. And then we can give a very little interpretation of things. We know we're being overly literal, but, yeah, we can. So part of that is quite funny. Uh, and and I, when I first started to do comedy, we were doing lineups. I was producing and emceeing more than doing comedy. And the first thing I did was in Alice Springs, and it was called Vagina Mono Laughs. And it was a take on Vagina Monologues was uh, four women talking about workplaces and sexism and those sort of cons ideas. And I was approached by a member of the local comedy troupe who said, I like what you're doing with women's comedy, but it has to be funny. And my response was, women's comedy? You mean comedy? So um, 
And and my final thing that I work a bit on is the idea of accessibility for performers. Quite often that what happens is that everything is accessible for the audience, but it's not accessible for the performers and changing the mindset around uh, I work with a number of performers who use wheelchairs as well and often there's no lift onto the stage or there's no dignified way to get onto the stage. Other ideas, access is not just about physical access. It's about sound and volume and distance from the audience and lighting and a number of other things for, for various, particularly for neurodivergent performers. Uh, but, yes, just at the end of my data collection, it's been quite a ride. We also did satire experiments where uh, three comedians did a Graham Norton style. I might just share a photo if that's okay. Um, this is a photo from one of them. Um, I'm going to have to stop sharing yours. Is that going to be okay? Yeah, go for it. Um, this I one here, can. this is this is like one of our panels, our satire experiments. <laughs> and these are three comedians in character. Two do very close to two. Uh, this obviously, if anyone can guess who's sitting next to me, uh, that is a, a young version of Tony Abbott. Um, and then this is Clive Palmer Jama. And this is Joe O'Byrne, who is a green arms dealer. Um, so, yeah, these are like Graham Norton style. Where they get to push, they got to push their character development and be as political as possible in front of a select audience and then reflect on it. So that was some of the ethnographic work we did. Um, and there were some really interesting things about, I think my favourite thing was comedy needs a HR department <laughs> because of all of the, the need for safe spaces, particularly for performers, of uh, gender diverse performers and for women and disabled and uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander performers. So that's that's my work. Stop the share now. Thank you. I'll just share mine again. Now I have to use my technical skills. All right. Okay, cool. Um, thanks, Jackie. That sounds like, you know, as someone who sometimes supervises PhDs, that sounds like a lot of data you've got there that you'll be analysing. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> sounds amazing. Okay, so um, just moving on to introduce myself now. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in linguistics in Aotearoa, and my research focuses on how discourse is used to reproduce and challenge social inequalities, and especially how minoritized groups use discourse to resist imbalances of power. So I got into humor research really by accident from this kind of minority rights angle. I was looking at how people use discourse to advance their interests, and I kept noticing that um, humor was one way that people were doing this, so I became interested in seeing how, how they were doing it language and discourse wise. Initially, my focus was on bicultural humour in Aotearoa, looking at how the Indigenous Māori and non-Māori New Zealanders um, use humour to negotiate issues relating to the history of colonisation in, in Aotearoa and decolonisation. And I'm still working on this theme in collaboration with a Māori colleague, but my main focus is now moving more towards gender, and also, um, and this is emerging, I guess, in what I'm doing more intersectional humour too, which is one of the reasons I wanted to have this um, panel with you all to talk about it. Um, across time, however, in all those different contexts, I think that the most interesting thing for me um, in this area really is the complexities of in-group and out-group humour. And there are five areas of um, minority humour that are particularly relevant to me. Um, queer disability, Māori, neurodivergent and trans humour. For two of these, I am part of the minoritised group as I am both queer and disabled. And humour within this category, this group of categories is really easy and fun for me. I can joke around about being queer or disabled all day long and sometimes that really, particularly with the disability side of things, does feel like it's, you know, all that's really getting me through the day. Um, and it's often not funny to people outside the group, but it can be pretty hilarious to me. Um, and it's one of the ways, I guess, my own form of kind of discursive resilience is to joke around about disability. Um, and I share those 
identities, the queer and dis disability identities with my partner, my twin sister, and my kid. Um, and it feels really good to joke together about them. I think it brings us closer together and it fortifies us for um, dealing with a heteronormative and ableist world. So that all feels good to me. Um, but for the other three areas on the other side of this, um, this, this 90s style Venn diagram that I made, it <laughs> doesn't make much sense visually, but um, uh, the uh, Maori trans and neurodivergent humor, and I'm not part of those groups, um, but I'm closely adjacent to them and that my partner is Māori and both my partner and child are trans and neurodivergent. So um, it's more delicate for me to joke around about these topics, um, given that I'm not part of the group. Sometimes I'll make a joke about, about um, autistic experiences or about trans experiences and it'll go down great and everyone's laughing and we all feel great. And sometimes I'll make a joke and it falls flat and they, both my kid and my partner will look at me like they want to stab me for a couple of seconds. You know, this happens. <laughs> it's, I think it's inevitable that when you're joking across um, minority lines, um, there are going to be moments when you don't get it right. Um, but I think that while this type of intergroup humour is harder in those ways and doesn't always go how you might want it to, I do think that this kind of intergroup humour is still, is really actually really important um, because it helps us to better understand each other and also to explore points of tension, to build when it works, to build our relationships so that we can navigate those areas of difficulty a little easier maybe next time. So um, I guess the thing that I'm most interested in at the moment in all of these areas really is this question of how can we go about navigating these kind of complexities across minority majority fault lines and what is to be gained by leaning in in those areas rather than turning away but most importantly how can we do that in a way that feels safe for everybody involved so um that's my intro and since we've all now introduced ourselves thank you very much everybody um i'm hoping that we can move to a bit of a discussion among the panel first um where we explore together some of the themes that have come up so far um, before we open up to the audience if you, those in the audience, if you in the audience already have questions that you want to add to the chat, feel free to do that and we'll come to those um, shortly as well. So I thought I might start off and ask a question myself and then we'll just throw back them back and forth amongst the group. Um, I think one of the things that I wanted to ask about Deb, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, Deborah, sorry, I'm not sure if you talked about this just now and I can't quite remember now, but we did talk before about um, the, the question of self-deprecating humour um, and you mentioned that that is quite relevant to you and your work that you do and the humour about women and older women in particular so um, it's a risky area isn't it and I thought that um, maybe you'd like to make a few more comments on how you see self-deprecating humour being used um, yeah. well or not well. Yeah. Thanks Julia. The thing with self-deprecating humour is that older people, and I'm sure other minority groups probably use it as well to get over that, um, the awkwardness or that they perceive when they're with others that are not like them. So as an older woman, and I try not to fall into this trap, I might say when I'm at work, oh, I, I went into the storeroom, but I've had to come out again because I couldn't remember what it was and I should have written myself a note. And like people at work would probably laugh at that, but it's damaging because it is an ageist comment. And so you have to be careful not to play into that. If I'm talking with my, my friends who are older, then as Julia said, if you're talking in a like-minded group, that's fine, but I don't want to play into that self-deprecating humour that then gets thrown back at me. Um, mm. And so I try very hard not to go down that track. And I did quite a lot of research about it in terms of in, it, when I was doing my doctorate. And the other thing about that self-deprecating humour, uh, the ageist birthday cards I'm sure you've seen them on the shelves and if we buy them for each other 
then we're just playing into to that ageist, self-deprecating thing that I just don't think is a good way to go. Mm, that's really interesting. What do you think, Jackie and Angelina? How do you feel that self-deprecation operates in, in the context you work in? Do you think, for instance, that it ever can be safe to make self-deprecating humour about yourself as part of a minority group when other majority group members are present? Or is it an absolute no-no? I think for me, I, I tend to avoid it. I tend, if I use it, I then flip it and go, you know, make a joke about the fact that it's self, yeah, in that way. So, I, yeah, I tend to avoid it and then, you know, invert it and then talk about how it's, a, you know, a problem through through constructing jokes that way. And I found quite a few of my participants that I, from my study, do the same. Right, so you kind of orient to the the stereotypes, if you will, but you make sure that you've got some kind of counter strategy to come in. Um, you know, mm. Yeah, don't do it out of context, out of a critical context. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Angelina? Um, yeah, um, I, I, I struggle with self-deprecating humour. Um, it, um, it's, very, it's very predominant in, in you know, um, my community and for a lot of reasons but it's very in-house and amongst ourselves we don't see a problem with it like it's it's also you know a form of catharticism and, and, and stress relief and and you know um just just life but it also when um i don't like really sharing that with a broader audience because i'm always con um, conscious and, and worry about the context in which it's received so sometimes that it, it's taken out of context and, you know, people aren't laughing with you, they're laughing at you and they, and um, it, it, it further instills stereotypes that you're trying to dis dismantle and dismiss. Um, and then sometimes, you know, on horrible occasions, it can be used um, to reinforce those things and weaponize it back against you as if mm -hmm. you weren't trying to educate in the first place. So um, that's a very dangerous thing. And that happens with, a lot of um, that can happen from, you know, a non-Indigenous audience. Like I've heard um, quite a few um, Aboriginal um, stand-up comedians say, you know, they've, 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 they've performed and given and shared and given it this educational, um, you know, show. And then afterwards, people still come up to them and ask these horrible racist stereotype questions like they haven't learned anything from the performance or the, or the mm. at all. So I... I, I it, 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 I, you know, we use it. I use it in my family. We use it, but we know each other. We have a relationship, so it, it's different. But sharing it is, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think I probably feel the same way about it. Um, I was talking to my my kid about um, trans humor the other day, and something that she said was that. She's open to joking about, she in principle, to joking about trans issues with people who aren't part of the group, but that it never never feels safe to her, even as like an 11-year-old. She says she's aware that, um, you know, mainly she will interact online with people and that she's so aware that humour has been used as a vehicle of um, oppression and um, of, of trans people, that whenever you put those two things together, trans people and joking, She's just absolutely on her guard because she's learned to be that way already by that age. So it does make me wonder to what degree um, that can be can be safe if you don't know the people. You know, maybe it maybe when people know each other, even if they are in, in group out group context, you've had ability to build trust in other ways that makes it feel safe. But you can't count on that with a with stranger. Yeah. Do any of you want to ask the next question of someone else? Um, I'll ask one, and it's just generally across across the board. How can humour be a hu healing um, a healing thing when there's so much difference in the world, and people like to point out those differences? How can we heal ourselves, or try and heal other people, so that we don't feel that we're copying it so much. 
<clears throat> Jackie, do you have any anything to uh, say? I I I had a a number of people in my cohort for this study that talked about healing through delivering comedy and through also um, making sure that that comedy stayed true to the to the purpose of being healing and um and that means like I was saying talking about with stereotypes really consciously flipping them um and and I know that there's been some you know backlash to the work of Hannah Gadsby about you know you know the, the comic the comedian that's killed comedy you know um and, and and I think that's really unfair because there's there's plenty of uh, that was I think one of the nicest things about my study was when I started I thought I had seen a lot of the dark side of comedy from being on the circuit. And what I found was an awful lot of the light side. Sorry, I walk with a light side, but I'm obviously a Star Wars fan. Um, but yeah, I, you know, there was, there, there's some really interesting work out there. Um, people like Jess Knight's Mormon Girl, if you get a chance to see that. Um, there, there's lots of, I'm, um, you know, lots of work around, you know people's stories and and they're they're both educational and it's also a lot of people have said there is a healing element for the comedian as well I had an experience in my show that I did it I did a show at the end of this study myself and pushed myself and there I, my show had a theme of of childhood religious trauma and I had a the first night I had a person come out of the crowd and I don't normally talk to people after because I struggle with it as an autistic person and the producer said there's someone I really think you should talk to and this young um, a trans a woman came up to me and wanted to give me a hug and I'm not much of a hugger but we hugged and said thank you I don't feel so alone um, and um, I'm I get I'm still getting a little emotional just thinking about that and that was pretty nice so I, I think there is work out there that is aiming to use whom to use you know humor effectively through uh you know combinations of storytelling and humor uh, you know maybe not just the classic stand up resting the mic on the chin observational um thing so i think there there are, there's definitely so i feel a lot more positive after this last year about probably the lesser known grassroots stuff <laughs> Mm. yeah that's awesome mm. and that yeah that example there of the person coming up to you really does show that power of the visibility doesn't it rather than um you know of groups that have not previously been as visible which is also mm. something you mentioned Deborah when you talked about um visibility as being a really important thing but with the with the visibility also comes a lot of risk right um personal risk to comedians and to groups um, in terms of how yeah how the work will be taken up and so on um, so yeah I don't know maybe Deborah do you have something else to say about that because you mentioned visibility as being a goal but um, how yeah what it, you can't do much with what happens once you're visible can you <laughs> then it's over to the people who are seeing you and what they do with it yeah I suppose from from an artist perspective we all strive a visual artist perspective we all strive for visibility because we're visual artists and we're we're desperate for our work to be seen and so i guess my work because i work do work about ageism i think it's it's hard to stay visible in that space because i think people are probably now a bit, a bit tired of it and there are other issues, bigger issues, um, homelessness and climate change and those sorts of things. So for a visual artist like me, I have to make new work and try and make myself visible as an older artist, which is very, very difficult. Mm. Young artists coming up, you know, they're, they're the next thing and that's what people want. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Anyone else? Maybe another question before we start to talk to the audience or comment. Angelina's talking, but I can't hear Angelina. Oh, we can't no, hear you. Can I talk? Can you hear me now? Yep, come yes. as close as you yes. can. Sorry. 
Um, I was just going to talk about the healing and visibility thing. I, 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 um, I think it's, you know, for Aboriginal and you know, First Nations humour, it's healing um, is connected to, you know, survival and resistance and all of that sort of stuff and um, speaking back to power. And, you know, I've learned from a very early age from comments from my elders about how to deal with being oppressed and how to be, be, deal with putting um, others, trying to put you in the box of the other. And I think with uh, the visibility, um, it, um, 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 when we tell stories and yarns and even some of that um, self-deprecating stuff, um, we find there's a, there's a solidarity between other minorities about the experiences that we share that people can find common. Then I think that universality of common common um, life experiences um, to a bigger audience sometimes occurs, and that's a really nice thing, which makes us more visible and understood. Mm. Um, and um, I've been amusingly um, reading some, um, you know, uh, colonial gazettes and newsletters from colonisation um, um, in trove, and, um, you know, they were documenting their witness of um, Indigenous humour in certain circumstances when when they come across people in the board <coughs> or they're working for them. And um, they're quite amused at this, the existence of humour and, and how happy <laughs> this naive sort of stereotype, oh, the natives are happy. It's really surprising that they're all in the bush, regardless of this, you know, this other culture being imposed upon them. So I've been reading them in a, you know, a David Attenborough type voice to myself, like a documentary, which has made <laughs> me laugh and, you know, <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's easier to uh, research. Right, yeah. So there's that kind of element of humour making some of the stuff just easier to digest at times, a strategy for ourselves to cope with it better too, yeah. maybe. Um, yeah. Do you think, before we will open up to the audience in just a minute, but just one question that I've been wondering about, there's something that you said, Jackie, but all of us really is, what is it about... Um, humor that can that is you know uniquely situated to help us um work towards different kinds of social change what is it that humor can do that other forms of discourse can't you know the more serious stuff the persuasive argumentative stuff the speeches the writing and that kind of thing what is it um I think you talked about one thing there already Angelina just now when you were talking about making it um making stories visible and reaching larger audiences and so on and yeah, and using it as a tool to cope with some pretty difficult um, material and history and experiences. Um, are there any other things any anyone wants to highlight about what they think how humor in particular is helpful? Yeah. Um, if I may, it be, we become less of a threat if we're making if the work we're doing is humorous. It's not perceived as a threat and therefore people sort of relax into it right yeah a strategy like a bit of a trojan horse type situation yeah yeah now, i was going to say the sleeper effect i got <laughs> the the um i think I've, I've seen i can't remember the author i think it might have been alison o'connor might have written about the sleeper effect in one of her papers um the idea that the, the element of surprise let's call it that you know the you know, I, when people come up to a, a, a comedian and say to them at the end of it, I wasn't expecting that, mm. um, you know, and, and then walking away with the aha moments, um, particularly from the kind of com the kind of comedian's work that I've been working with and speaking to, you know, there's these real aha moments. Mm. So actually helping mm. people understand better as well. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I'm, Thanks so much, everyone. We'll keep on talking, but we're going to start talking with everyone else as well now. Um, so I'd like to open up the discussion to the audience and invite any comments or questions any of you have at this point. I don't think there's anything in the chat yet, so feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. I'll look out for raised hands, but I might not be able to see them all. So we'll just see if we can do it um, informally. Um, and you're welcome to respond however you wish to. I've just copied here the questions I asked our panelists before when we started working on this in case that's useful prompts for you. Um, but uh, over to you. 
if anyone's brave enough to ask a question or give a comment or a question that's more of a comment really or whatever we do at conferences. Okay, we've got a question in here, um, which is Angelina, what do you know about the role of clowns in Indigenous history and culture? Um, I don't know. <laughs> 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 I know there's, there's definitely, I don't know, is a professional, what, uh, what do you mean like clowns, like professional clowning people or people who do that? Does the person who, um, wanted who asked this question want to expand a bit either um by voice or in the chat if they're still here oh uh, it says that the um aboriginal communities used to have clowns to help settle feuds does that mean anything to you angelina um um yeah i don't know maybe not oh, well not in, in in that context i suppose that okay. there's, there's a lot of um there's definitely um a lot of um you know the, the, uh, the, you can um identify the presence of humor in you know aboriginal people are very uh, uh, good at mimicry so you'll find that in dance and ceremony you'll find you know which um um there's a documentation of and people and you can do it today people will laugh at you know um dance movements and that um the uh, the uh, the, the best example, one of the best examples of that are the tricky dancers who started, you know, th this hilarious um, dance routine um, in respect to a, um, you know, a community worker that was that, um, a Greek community worker that helped them out. And so, you know, um, yeah, so it exists in there and exists, you know, humor, it, <laughs> it exists as a, in an emotion in, in, be, in, in us as beings as it does everyone else. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. sure. You know, I'm sure I, I said it a lot, and I'm sure you know pre-colonization there was some there's a lot of slapstick and funny jokes and things flying around that we weren't sitting around bored staring at a river. I'm sure something must have happened. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you. We've got to thank you in the chat for that. Thank you, Angelina. Does anybody else want to um, make a comment or ask a question? Or we can just keep oh here comes one in the chat we've got shy people here okay um what happens when you have a mixed audience some sharing the comedian's minority status and others not can this be used positively to promote learning and harmony or does it tend to polarize um yeah that's a really great question it's just making me think of it's a slightly different context but um an article that i read by a colleague of mine corinne seals who analyzed how a lesbian comedian did different routines when talking to different audiences so one a more queer audience and one a more of a straight audience and did a discourse analysis of the different jokes that were used and all the different forms of intertextuality and what worked and what didn't work and so on um, and it was very clear that this one comedian was doing quite different things with the different audiences which just supports really Jessica's question here which is how it would have had to be a whole third routine if they had everyone in the room I think um, so good question um, and I don't I'm not a comedian so I'll leave that I think to those of you who are Jackie you look like you've got something to say yeah I was nodding furiously with you um, yeah there's definitely plan A plan B plan C plan D <laughs> um, as I said my last show I did I really pushed the boundaries of talking about childhood uh, religious trauma and how do you talk about that? It's really hard. Um, and it, you know, there, the, you know, you definitely have to be really, at least you really do have to read the room. Um, and I think also there's a, a thing, particularly with festivals, uh, on the open mic circuit, it's a lot more <laughs> scary. Uh, but festivals have are becoming in some ways more risk averse, but it's for I think for very good reasons much more content warnings, much clearer marketing, uh, you know, making sure that there is a mix. But, I mean, I've had people uh, from the out group in my shows and so have a number of my participants, uh, and I don't call a lot of walkouts to being discussed, but it does happen. Um, 
but you know it's I think there's a lot of thought going in particularly with festivals like Melbourne Fringe Festival um, Adelaide Fringe you know Melbourne International Comedy Festival uh, definitely thinking about content warnings and about how things are marketed so that they don't polarize uh, because obviously it's not good for the industry as well I think you get less bums on seats but you also said, didn't you, Jack, when we were talking the other day, um, that there tends to be a lot of these content warnings attached to minority performers in particular, right? And yeah, not so yeah. much necessarily to majority performers. So what's going Definitely. on there? Uh, I, I, like, I think it's a bit of a reflection of whatever's going on in the outside world. We had, uh, there was a show at Melbourne Fringe called Tea for Tea. It was transgender for transgender. And that performance was eight transgender performers a night for eight nights. And the the it was marketed very clearly that this is for people from the gender diverse community. There was a line in the marketing that said, you are welcome to bring your um, heteronormy support person. But it was it was pitched in a way that was like that. And the issue for them was they had to do a risk action plan <laughs> for eight different performers for eight nights. And they had to have come up with content warnings for that. And it became very convoluted and very complicated. The reason that they set it up the way they did was to prevent, you know, this was supposed to be a space for people to do to engage in in group humor. So, um, but yeah, the, the, there was a very complex discussion around how that was marketed and the content warnings. So, yeah, and that that's at the moment it's a, an extremely difficult space for trans people. Mm. Um, so that's not surprising, I suppose, in that sort of reflection of what's going on. Um, turn on Sky News. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's also about performer safety about performer safety, about audience safety, the two, you know, you can't necessarily, I don't think you can necessarily separate them too much. No, that's right. Mm. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Or from the panel? Oh, um, the, 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 there's definitely... When a uh, community is speaking to each other, in, in my family, there's definitely only two different types of delivery um, and Jack telling and humorous stories um, that's delivered to um, between us and to, you know, a, a non-Indigenous audience or non-Indigenous people, that's for sure. But, you know, you know, I think we like to keep and we should keep some things to ourselves, whether it's, um, you know, polarising uh, to, to an audience or... You know, I really like I like I like the work of that um, uh, Amir um, and Nazim who did Legally Brown, and they're brave enough to actually attack ra attack racism straight on with humour. And it's about mm. truth telling. And I think we just have to keep doing it until Australia is mature enough to actually embrace and accept, you know, the, the the issues that minorities face and go through without getting defensive and and using the guilt word all the time. Um, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Think, Do you think, um, Angelina, um, you know, you talked in your um, intro about um, education, humour and education. Sometimes, you know, when you describe it like that, it, it can feel a bit like, oh, wow, it's just more of this work that minorities have to be engaged in all the time trying to explain themselves to others. Yeah. Um, and the fact there's so much work involved in just existing. <laughs> um, and yeah, so that's a feels like a tension to me as well that humor has this education effect, but also that it can be quite exhausting to constantly be needing to do that. And or not just, you know, not when making jokes, but in all areas of our life. I mean, we've got it in different areas, but I think about, you know, having to deal with schools for to get, you know, disability inclusive policies or when something goes wrong trans wise and dealing with that and then the hospital and then the extended family and you just feel like you're doing it all, all day long some of the time, right? Yeah, yeah, which is why I started doing it in the first place because I was like, I was, I was burnt out with the education process. Like just living is a, is a you can't just be, be. You're always, um, you know, justifying and, 
and um, reiterating who you are and defending and it's just it's just tiring so I just thought oh you know I'm getting burnt out with this sort of process even just in a normal day-to-day job you know how I how how can I do this and you know I can see and it's just so predominant in our community in my family that is like I'm, I'm using it um, because it you know it's a maybe like humor is more it creates a more even playing field for people to have these discussions about stuff mm. that might offend them or they find hard to address or whatever yeah right yeah I see Ben you've got your hand raised oh yeah Julia if that's okay for you and all the members on the panel and thanks for all of your wonderful contributions it's fantastic listening to all of you there um so you know, Julia you brought that up about labor and Angelina brought it up, like all the labor that goes into just saying, you know, who you are and like justifying that and all of, you know, that constant repetitive work that burns you out slowly but steadily. <laughs> that is like, I'm um, so I was wondering if you could, like to all of you, um, wherever you feel comfortable answering that, but what would you wish that people would understand just get without you having to put in all of that work, <laughs> that labor? Or as you know, Deborah pointed out by um, 80s for housework, dressing is a like a microclock fiber, you know, piece of like thing and then being dragged, I think it's a hilarious thing. Um, so what would you wish people would just get where well, you wouldn't have to put in all, the, and so you could move on to other things, you know, other art pieces or other humorous things. So what's, you know, the one thing you would wish, please just understand this and let me go on. If I could jump in there, if people didn't say you're old, and it's a heterogeneous sort of situation where we're all the same. People don't seem to understand, and I'm sure this is Angelina and Jackie would agree that they're, we're all different. I might be old, but I'm, I'm completely different to a person, another older person, my, like my age or old, and Angelina, you'll probably have the same thing, but we're all just, we're old, or you're black, or you're this, or you're that, and there's there's where do you move from when that's lumped on you? Uh, this sounds like good closing comments. So I think that we could maybe go around the different panelists and see what they have to say. Uh, very similar. I, you know, I say if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. And, and I do have a joke that is, you know, wow, you're not like my nephew, which I respond, yes, who would have thought 484,000 billion pairs of DNA could be wrong? Um, and then I usually end that by saying, and, and, and I know because I've counted them. And then there's a set after that that counters that stereotype about always being in IT or always being in science or always being, the, you know, the good doctor stereotype. So, yeah, same sort of similar thing. If you've met, you've met one, you've met one. <laughs> Oh. Angelina, do you want to go next? Sorry, I've kind of forgotten what the question well, One thing that you wish other people could would know is that you wouldn't have to keep banging on about it and educating them about it by um, human. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that we're human like any other. Um, and then there's a diversity um, in, in, in our community as well, you know, the intersection stuff that we talk about you know I'm a woman and I'm an Aboriginal woman and I'm um, a Garang Garang woman and I'm from Queensland but I'm also from Brisbane um, and you know apart from these cultural identity things that make me unique they also make me different and across the board too I'm you know I'm a writer I'm a traveler I'm a foodie uh, I'm a swimmer I love swimming so like there's all these other things um, you know that I'm constantly trying to uh, break out of a, uh, being put in a box for, or you know, um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I would just add there that I think certainly thinking about disability in particular that it would be really great if people could move on from a kind of pity perspective when they approach us. Um, and I think it does apply to some other minority groups too, that the idea that, you know, people might feel sorry for us because there's something wrong with us. Um, whereas we're, um, most of us are quite happy in our minoritized identities actually and if everyone would just leave us the hell alone let us get on with our lives we'd be fine that's when the yeah how other people approach us that starts to become the problem I guess yeah okay we've got a um some things in the quote here 
it says what the panelists here are real pioneers. <laughs> thank you for thank you. Thank you all for taking on this important work. Um, so um, thanks for that. Um, and we've just running out of time. So I'll just move to the end to say um, thank you to all of you for coming along to this round table. Um, and that I hope we can all continue to work together to advance social change, but hopefully with a smile on our face at least some of the time. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.